Hello and welcome back to another episode of Math with Sun. Today we're going to be talking about AP Physics 1, Newton's Second Law for Rotational Motion. And today I want to draw a big difference between when we talked about Newton's Law with regular linear motion, it was just the sum of all forces acceleration. But now when we're talking about rotary motion or rotational motion, it's going to be the sum of all torque, which is the force that is causing the angular motion, uh, acceleration. Um, it will involve this new symbol called I, the moment of inertia, and alpha, which is the angular acceleration. Okay, and the reason we have to deal with it differently here is that it's not always a uniform mass. All right, not only that, but the amount of mass and where it's located will affect how fast the object will like to turn and how much force it will be like needed to get it to turn. An example of this would be as if we have an Olympic uh, ice skater here, if their arms are away from each other, they're gonna actually kind of slow down versus when they pull them in, causing the radius to get smaller, they speed up. Their angular acceleration would get faster. All right, their mass remained the same, yet their angular acceleration changed. And you have to be asking yourself, well, how is that possible if we were using regular linear motion because they would, they would, they would have to be proportional, all right? So, with that in mind, you have to think about it differently. The closer it is to the radius, the quicker it will become versus, and therefore uh, the, the more force would be applied essentially, versus the further away it is, the slower it will become, all right? So with that in mind, there are several different common formulas for moment of inertia. And uh, there are a few here. I'm gonna focus on the few that I think are going to be the most common examples with the AP exam. Uh, not necessarily with my examples, but like I'm gonna draw attention to this one. A massless string, so to speak, if you had a ball at the end of it, w the moment of inertia, the I would just equal MR squared, which kind of makes sense because it's spinning in a circle, all right? Versus these two rods that I wanna draw attention to, to kind of hone in the point. The moment of inertia will be more the further the mass is from the spinning pivot point, okay? So here we had the moment of inertia is equal to mr squared, the mass times r squared. But what if we took that mass and we kind of uniformly spread it out over the entire rod? Well, if that were the case, then you would have your mr squared divided by three, all right? And that's with it hinged at the end. Well, what if it was hinged in the middle? That means that you would kind of like lose some of that. It would be spread out even more, and that's why we divide it by 12, because it's spread out even more. You don't have to understand completely why the formulas exist the way they are, but it is kind of important to notice that the further away from the pivot the mass becomes, the more and more moment of inertia you would actually have. We're dividing by three, so it's less. We're dividing by 12, so it's even, even less, okay? So, got a few examples. Uh, with AP Physics, I would imagine that they're either going to give you the moment of inertia or you're going to have to solve for it with all the other information that you would need provided. All right, so this first one, we got a tennis ball. It has a mass of 0.32 and a radius of 0.56. The rotational inertia of the ball is given to us. 2 fifths mr squared. Very convenient and nice. You're not going to have to memorize that. That would be insane. Where R is the radius of the ball. What is the torque required to give the ball an angular velocity, velocity, not acceleration, of five meters radians per second in 0.6 seconds? So we are looking for torque. We are looking for torque. The formula for the torque will equal the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. You may notice that we do not have the angular acceleration. That's the, the issue with this problem. However, you can use rotational kinematics to find it. With this formula that I've written. So your angular velocity final will equal your angular velocity initial times time plus the angular acceleration times time. So if we figure out all of this, what do we know uh, in the beginning? Give the ball an angular velocity of five radians per second in six seconds. So that would mean that we would know our final angular velocity. We can plug that in, five radians per second. Would equal the initial, it was starting at rest. So with that starting at rest, that would go away. So plus 
angular acceleration times time, which is 0.6 seconds. So if we solve by dividing by 0.6 seconds, we would end up with this divided by 0.6 seconds, which would end up with an angular acceleration of 0.5 divided by 0.6, which is 8.3 uh, radians per second squared as the angular acceleration. You needed that because, again, we're looking for torque in this problem, and we needed to plug that in. We do kind of have our angular um, inertia, the moment of inertia part, because we have the formula. We can plug everything else in to find that moment of inertia. So I is equal to 2 fifths mr squared. And therefore, we have a mass of 0.32, a radius of 0 0.056. If we plug that stuff in, 0.32 kilograms times 0 0.056 meters, you would find out the angular momentum is equal to, not momentum, angu the, the moment of inertia, I want to call it momentum, that's next in the video, 0, 0, 003 newton meters. Okay, well now we have the I, and we have the angular acceleration, you just plug them in. Torque will equal 8.3 radians per second squared times 0 0.003 newton meters, you would end up with, I haven't done that one yet, got to multiply them, um, 0 0.003 times 8.3 ends up being a torque of 0 0.0249, which is close enough for me to say 0 0.025. All right, next up, we have a rod being hung and hinged on its left side. A uniform rod, uniform rod of two meters long and has a mass total of 3.6 kilograms. What is the angular acceleration of the rod when it is released from the horizontal position? So assume that there's a rod right here, kind of attached to a wall or hinged to a wall, and it's being released. So it's going to be, be moving that away. Now, when it's released, its mass is going to be dead center, so to speak and gravity will affect it, all right? So with that in mind, we need to figure out the angular acceleration. So we're gonna start with torque is equal to the inertia times the angular acceleration, which means that the angular acceleration would equal torque divided by that inertia, T over I. What else do we know? Well, we know that it has two meters long and has a mass of 3.6. We also know from this page over here, they didn't provide it to us, but it is going to be a rod length L with a mass M hinged at the end. So the I is going to equal mass times radius squared divided by three. So, or you could think of it as one third, one third its mass times radius squared. Torque on top. Okay, so what is the torque? Well, the torque would be equal to however far it is away. Well, if it's a two meter long thing, the gravity will be affecting it in center mass, which would be one meter away. And torque, assuming gravity is perpendicular like normal, would be one times, because it's perpendicular, times its weight, times gravity, 10, or negative 10, negative, put the negative there. And then we have the one third, the mass, which is 3.6, times the radius squared, which would be the full two meters, two squared. Do the calculations, negative one times 3.6 times 10, divided by all of this, you would get an angular acceleration reading of negative 7.5 radians per second squared. Ask yourself, why is it negative? Well, it is going down, right? And down is considered clockwise in this uh, problem, and clockwise is negative. So it is going down at negative 7.5 radians per second squared. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to do it for this one. I will see you all in the next one. Stay positive, my friends.